Hi, my name is Wendy Moliner, and I chose juvenile detention and its processes reform theory into practice as my topic for my literature review. And today I'm going to present my PowerPoint and highlight a few aspects of it. Um, we really have to understand and realize our capitalistic society had a lot to do with juvenile, the juvenile justice system and its reform over the last decades. Um, historically, class division has created harsh treatment and handlings of troubled youth, especially among the lower class. Early reforms for them would, can, would be within their family and their community by using social controls. Um, if families had still had problems with their youth, they could be bound out to other families and put to work, or they could be put in almshouses, uh, which was basically just a, a building with one room where many people were housed. The affluent members of society just shipped their children off to boarding school. The 1800s had an influence on juvenile reform due to immigration increasing, urban growth, and economic problems. So these, uh, in, these three aspects influenced uh, the crime rate. Crime went up, juvenile delinquency went up. So reformers decided they needed to have a place just for juveniles. And they established the New York House of Refuge, which was actually the first juvenile reformatory in the United States. And their philosophy was simple, instill religion and educational principles with in the children. Um, of course, their philosophy wasn't always put into practice, and several studies did re reveal this. So there was criticism that the uh, New York House of Refuge was not helping the children at all. Um, so due to criticism and the abolition of contract labor, uh, they were the House of Refuge was, was forced to implement a new philosophy. And this philosophy took on um, more of a military type influence or philosophy to the children. And once again, once their practices were looked at to see if they were put, their philosophies were put into practice, they failed to do it again. So as it turns out, due to the criticism of the Houses of Refuge, the fact that the philosophies that were supposed to be put in practice were failing, um, it led to the Child Savers Movement, which, is, which was comprised of prominent women of society, and they advocated for the urban poor children of society. This also paralleled with the feminist movement. And so their goal was to provide children with proper shelter, adequate clothing and food, and an education. And although they received criticism, claiming they may have ulterior motives um, as to why they were doing what they were doing uh, to gain them better status in society, they were um, strong advocates for children. They were instrumental in advocating for the juvenile court Lay, uh, establishing labor laws for juveniles, uh, social workers, and other programs to uh, help the children. So the first juvenile court was established in Cook County, Illinois in 1899. And this is the first time a court, the court wanted to look at youth as a delinquent that could be rehabilitated versus looking at them as a criminal. Um, so the court did institute several rehabilitative measures. Um, it did re receive criticism, though, because these rehabilitative measures and programs were not um, implemented throughout all jurisdictions. Um, another criticism of the court was that uh, juveniles did not receive the same due process rights as adults. Um, so in 1961, Kennedy, the Kennedy administration created some measures to uh, preventive measures for children and adolescents most at risk and establish some more diversion programs instead of the high rate of uh, detention. And three landmark cases, Supreme Court landmark cases that influenced um, change in the court was the Kent versus U.S. in summary, provide measures of guidance for rehab rehabilitation of youth. And Galt versus U.S., it actually gave juveniles the same due process rights as adults. And in Winship versus U.S., the due process clause clause protects the accused um, and really implemented upon proof beyond a reasonable doubt into the juvenile court. So the result of the Supreme Court decisions actually changed the once private, intimate type attention juveniles got in the very beginning when the court was established. Um, the expansion of the juvenile court, it actually expanded its control over more and more juveniles um, whether it be a status offense or a criminal offense. 
Um, and although it wasn't their intended result, they actually had more and more juveniles coming in contact with the court system and being um, placed in detention or rehabilitative centers. Um, and this was one of the criticisms of the court. And the fact that um, they saw expansion of juveniles being in the system, the mindset started to change, claiming that rehabilitation was not working and that we should be more tough on crime. So in the 1990s began the largest surge of extremely punitive and retributive, retributive policies within the juvenile justice system. It, resi it resulted in increased incarceration and transfers of juveniles to the adult courts. It resulted in a higher rate um, of detention of juveniles, uh, higher than the juvenile justice system had ever seen to that date. Clinton signed the, uh, President Clinton signed the Violent Crime Control and Law Enforcement Act in 1994, and it had consequences for the juvenile justice pro, uh, system. It lowered the age limit from 15 to 13 years of age for certain federal crimes. Uh, there were strong penalties were increased for selling or possessing drugs in or around schools or the youth facilities and made possessing a firearm a felony for a juvenile, and they developed military boot camps as alternatives to detention. Additionally, at the same time, the Gun-Free School Act was passed, um, which is where the philosophy of zero tolerance policies came into our schools. So even though the juvenile justice policies were becoming more punitive um, and passing more laws, there were still visionaries out there who felt rehabilitation was more effective. And it was up to the individual states and jurisdictions to adopt these initiatives. Um, so Massachusetts Department of Youth, they actually um, used community-based um, programs for juveniles prior to the punitive movement, and they continued to use those. Missouri looked at Massachusetts and um, designed their framework for the community-based um, programs and alternatives to detention and actually expanded it. They actually so, were so successful in their programs uh, with youths and the services that they provided, many states modeled their um, community-based services after the Missouri model. There's two significant federal initiatives, the Juvenile Detention Alternatives and the Models for Change. These two initiatives are credited for their, for their successful implementation of community-based services, which resulted in the continual decrease of detention among juveniles. In short, the JDAI model, um, in their 2011 report reported a 30% decline in detention of juveniles, even though they had a 5% increase in their length of stay. Um, there was no indication of increase in crime and there was no indication of recidivism. And the models for change, um, this mo these models have been immensely proactive in helping shape the thinking process of many advocates and pr um, practitioners into how to really handle juveniles. And in their 2011 report, the foundation reported that 52 detention facilities in 18 different states closed over a four-year period. The uh, Juvenile Justice Initiative Report filed in 2018 on Illinois' detention of juveniles. It provides the legislators um, with current state fiscal oversight and administration involvement on juvenile detention. It provides them information on that. And the fact that Illinois is considered one of the leaders in the juvenile justice and juvenile reforms. We have the first court, we reduced detention facilities, and we had aggressive legislation passed in re, uh, reforming juvenile detention. Research still indicates, though, that on both federal and state levels, we still struggle to implement best practices. Um, the Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention Act had not been updated since 2002. President Donald Trump signed uh, a reauthorization of that bill in December of 2019 with some significant additions attached to it. It uh, entailed new standards for jurisdictions to treat youth in an age-appropriate way. It mandated community-based treatment and family engagement, core protection for minors, uh, status offenders and youths as adults, tried as adults, data collection requirements, and grant funding was based on compliance of the Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Pre Prevention Act's initiatives. And additionally, at the same time, the First Step Act was signed, 
and that was setting federal standards for solitary confinement with the intent that the states would adopt the similar measures. So in conclusion, there is considerable information presented in highlighting the processes and the time it took for juvenile reforms to actually develop over the last few decades. Evidence is produced favorable results to indicate alternative programs to detention were effective, but subsequently ignored, due in part by influential policymakers and the affluent class of society did not always have the best interests of juveniles in, at heart. It took nearly 28 years to update the Juvenile Justice Delinquency Act and another 18 years to reauthorize it. Research has shown we are in a more rehabilitative mindset when it comes to juveniles and we're learning from our past mistakes, but continued reforms need to be funded. They need to be rehabilitative and effectively put into practice, both on federal and state levels. The future of our youth does depend on it. Thank you very much for listening to my presentation.